Harlow, Harlow. Harlow, one, two, three, four. <clears throat> Harlow, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Yep, just making sure there's plenty of audio there on the, the camera. Good evening, Richard. Good evening. Oh, it's an echo. Good evening. This is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel. VK3 uh, Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria, with the regular Friday night broadcast coming to you from the studios of VK3 Charlie Sierra Juliet in Narrewarren South. A very pleasant good evening to everybody that's tuning in tonight on this uh, fifth day of uh, November and um, we are broadcasting on prime frequency of 3541 kilohertz in the 80 meter amateur radio band and uh, simulcasting on 160 in the uh, on uh, 1865 uh, kilohertz in our medium wave uh, service <laughs> broadcasting to the uh, Pacific Islands so <laughs> Good evening everybody, uh, we have uh, also ATV running, high definition, but uh, due to the uh, Melbourne TV repeater being currently off air, uh, VK3 RTV is in a, a few little troubles. Uh, we're still beaming a signal towards the repeater on 1255 and uh, <clears throat> in glorious DVBS2. So if anybody wants to turn their grid packs around to the Narry Warren South area and see if they can pick me up on the direct in uplink uh, frequency of 1255 uh, give it a go I've already got I think Richard are you watching the uh, uplink frequency as well um, I know Tony is VK3 VAT I know there's one viewer out there uh, <laughs> anyway um, so well, I know there's one viewer watching the uh, uplink frequency in glorious HD so um, that's good we're also streaming by the YouTube uh, link, um, which can be found on the ASV website at www.asv.org.au. That's double. What's that? What was that, Richard? He said something. No, no. All right. <laughs> Um, it's my uh, offline uh, producer there. Um, anyway, uh, so we're uh, also on YouTube now. I, I would uh, reckon because we're not going through the Melbourne TV repeater, which usually brings in a, a swag of other viewers, uh, either via the uh, direct via the repeater. Oh, okay, cool. All right. Is there much of a delay on the system? Is there? <laughs> anyway, um, oh, I got Tony watching. I know that. On a, a very very sharp low, but the back of my grid pack. And I've got a visitor that's walked into the shack. Um, my uh, uh, furry little puss. Has, uh, I saw its tail go past the camera view there, so I'm being visited by a puss cat. Um, so anyway, uh, we're also uh, yeah. So I would uh, uh, strongly suggest that for tonight um, to. Um, Tune into the YouTube channel, and uh, which, like I say, can be found at the ASV website at www.asv.org.au. Look under the Radio Astronomy tab at the top of the screen there. Click on the Radio Astronomy tab, and down the bottom of the pull-down box, you'll see the link to the ASV radio broadcast. And you open up that page, and uh, you'll see the uh, YouTube stream window. Now, I only say that. Uh, Part two reasons, I guess. Uh, uh, repeat is not working, but 
Um, I've got some wonderful pictures uh, here of the uh, recent uh, Aurora um, Australis uh, over uh, the uh, looking due south of here. There's, there's about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven images. In fact, there's even one image that's a video um, which I couldn't download because it's uh, Facebook Facebook orientated. Uh, it's a bit tricky to uh, to download video off uh, Facebook um, unless you've got the right uh, arrangement. So where's my cat here? I don't want to step up. I'm just got to do something for a tick. <coughs> Listing 1294 at the moment. Um, so, uh, having said all that, uh, yeah, so that's that's the reason why uh, I'm suggesting YouTube uh, for those who can't uh, monitor usual frequencies. So, uh, in it's already five past the hour. Uh, I've got a few things here. Uh, I've got the uh, the sky notes to go through, courtesy of Tanya Hill. Uh, I think it's Tanya from the Science Works Planetarium. That usually takes me a while to read through all that. But uh, I do have the audio file from uh, Astrophys. Now, I, you, for those folks that are tuning in that might remember, last week I had a, the audio, uh, the podcast, the ready to go. For the life of me, I'm not sure uh, what happened because when I checked that audio file, the same audio file that I, as far as I know, had I, I had running, uh, it uh, it worked. You know, the interview was there, and I thought, well, why in the hell did I stop it? You know, <laughs> what made me think that the uh, the recording wasn't working? I I, I heard Brendan's uh, uh, voice uh, start, and he was uh, doing his usual uh, uh, lead up. Um, but uh, I, well, I didn't hear anything more after that and I thought okay the uh, audio recording had failed so I, I went into the next thing but I, I ch checked it after the broadcast I checked it and, and it was all there so I have no idea what happened to it last week but I've got it it's, it's there I'll run it tonight it only goes for about five six minutes it's only a very quick interview um, but it's interesting to have a listen to uh, to the um, to the doctor um, having a, a bit of a talk and uh, I'll bring that up in uh, just a short moment or two. Just to briefly, for those folks that are, might be tuning in for the first time tonight, <laughs> and we already have a few folks up there on the chat window, and I forgot to mention that. Ah, uh, yes, the chat window. <coughs> Excuse me. If you want to uh, call into the Discord chat window and uh, come up either an anonymously or with your real name or call sign, that's totally up to you. Um, uh, there's a Discord chat window that you uh, can come up on. And um, you can find that also on the ASV website uh, in the same tab that I've been referring to a million times um, for the ASV broadcast. And you'll see uh, the link to the Discord uh, chat window. <coughs> it's a little dish picture of the Parks Radio Telescope dish. You, you click on that and away you, you, you come into our little chat window there. And I can see that we've got, um, we've got Nebs. Where did I start? There, okay. We've got... Um, Martin VK7JAH who's uh, tuned in. Uh, we have uh, Joe McGee uh, who's uh, tuned in as well. G'day Joe. Uh, we've also got uh, uh, Richard VK3VRS local ham. Uh, we have uh, Graham VK3 Golf Lima in Bunyip and Roberto VK3XRA. Good call sign XRA. I really do like that. Uh, okay, so and there's uh, somebody else just about to type something. It's come, saying here it's uh, Mike A is typing. So we've got to <laughs> so go for it, guys. Start a, a chat there while I'm talking. That's fine. The Astronomical Society of Victoria, founded in 1922, uh, comprises some. I haven't checked lately, but it's a, last time I checked, it was about 1,600 members. Membership of the society is open to anybody that's got an interest in astronomy. Of course, the Society's objectives are to encourage the study and practice of astronomy. Meetings are usually held on the second Wednesday, and that reminds me, I didn't check that. Oh, but I can in a minute. Uh, meetings are usually held on the second Wednesday of each month. Uh, and if uh, everything was kosher, we'd be having the meetings at 8 p.m. at the Mulia Hall National Herbarium in Burwood Avenue, Melbourne, which may start next year. Uh, we. Uh, uh, also, privileges of the membership include the right to borrow books from the uh, extensive library, uh, which I haven't visited for such a long time. 
Uh, again, the library is located at the, at the Melbourne Observatory. So uh, again, COVID's been causing restrictions with that. Uh, so I'm not really sure what the current situation is with the library, but nevertheless, uh, ASV does have a magnificent library. Uh, there's also a regular uh, news magazine called uh, ASV Crux, uh, which contains articles, news, observing notes and the like. And there's a, an annual book, uh, it's called the Astronomical Yearbook, kind of like a, an almanac of sorts, uh, which um, provides data for local observations, informative summaries of various celestial objects and other astronomical information to uh, optical astronomers. Um, there's also uh, uh, on the members nights, which is now happening again, access is available to telescopes on members nights held regularly at the Melbourne Observatory. I believe that's uh, they're now starting up again. These instruments include the Society's 300mm equatorial reflector and there's also a 300mm portable reflector. There's also a 200mm refractor managed by the Royal Botanic Gardens and a photoheliograph for also used at, housed at the observatory and members of the ASV have access to these telescopes uh, as well. Regular Society Club Night meetings are held on the first and last Fridays of each month at the Society's Property Club Room, uh, located in Burwood. Uh, members are encouraged to use the Society's instruments located there in order to gain first-hand experience in telescope use. These instruments include a 508mm equatorial reflector. It's quite a beautiful telescope. Uh, members are also encouraged to make use of the Society's Country Property, located near Heathcote, some 90-minute drive north of Melbourne. The Leon Mao Dark Sky Site, LMDSS, offers superb views away from light polluted Melbourne and is an ideal spot for visual observing and astrophotography including radio astronomy. Members are encouraged to make and use telescopes. Um, advice and help on both matters are provided willingly to newcomers desiring to do the same. Instrument making is only one of the number of common interest activities catered for within the society. Various activities addressed include uh, deep sky observing, astrophotography, lunar and planetary observing, auroral, meteor, comet and variable star observing, radio astronomy, computing, cosmology and astrophysics, historical studies and research and astronomy in general. Contact details for various section directors are provided in the yearbook, but if you don't have access to the yearbook, uh, the best thing to do then is to go to the ASV website at www.asv.org.au and look under the sections tab for all the information there in regards to the various 20, 20 sections, 20 active, active um, sections that make up uh, the various activity groups for the ASV. Otherwise you can pull out the pen and write a letter to the Secretary of the Astronomical Society of Victoria, GPO Box 1059, Melbourne, Australia 3001. That's the Secretary, Astronomical Society of Victoria, GPO Box 1059, Melbourne, Victoria 3001, and all will be revealed. But, like I say, the uh, ASV website uh, is a, uh, a swag of information, and uh, you can find out all about this the society, which this broadcast is on behalf of, and has been since 1988. So, um, there it is. How about another squig of coffee here? And also, <coughs> there is an email address if you wish to send the signal reports tonight. <coughs> uh, the um, email is vk3ekh at gmail.com. That's vk3echo kilo hotel, vk3ekh at gmail.com. And I am watching the inbox as we speak, including the um, including the uh, the. Uh, Discord chat window and there's a couple of things waving from me up there. We've got uh, Mr. Mike uh, VK3XL uh, who's not too far away, he's waving <laughs> and we have Bill VK3KHT uh, also waving at me. These crazy gift images you guys find, I don't know. Alright, let's get to the wonderful Sky Notes produced by the, the wonderful Tanya Hill, at least I think it's from Tanya Hill, she used to do it at least anyway. So I'm now going to go off uh, VMix and uh, I go to, uh, I really do need another screen here now. Um, 
ASV, okay. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Before we go to the Sky Notes, um, yes, uh, the Leon Mount Dark Sky site is now open for the members to uh, go to, uh, but bookings are required to uh, announce the fact that you're going to be up there and visiting. So, um, if you are familiar with the booking system, uh, it's available. You can see it through the home page of the ASV, of course. Uh, but uh, there are still restrictions in, in uh, force at the moment, but uh, the, the point is we can get up to the site at any time now with a certain degree, to a certain degree. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, okay, now, monthly meeting. Uh, rah, 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 rah. So, yes, monthly meetings are held on the second Wednesday of each month, streaming through our Facebook page and the YouTube channel. So. Uh, all the monthly meetings that have been uh, streamed uh, since the COVID has come online have been available to view via Facebook via the Facebook ASV page. You so if you're on Facebook, you can catch up with it on um, uh, type in Astronomical Society of Victoria in the search engine, and you will find the um, the stream uh, for Wednesday night, second of uh, Wednesday, second Wednesday, which is coming up, and tenth uh, of November. And uh, which starts at 8 p.m. So, and of course, YouTube. Uh, ASV has their own YouTube channel. So, again, you go to YouTube, type in Astronomical Society of Victoria, and it all will be revealed. <laughs> um, so, we have a uh, um, we have uh, somebody by the name of Isabel Romeo Romero Shaw. Isabel Romero Shaw from Monash University. And she's talking, uh, her topic is Star Words, the entomologies of the names of the planets and other space related names. So how stars get their names, like Harrison Ford and um, Sean Connery, no, not those sort of stars, sorry, went off on a tangent there. <laughs> anyway, so that's next Wednesday on the 10th of November at 8 p.m. So be there or be square. It's a horrible thing, adage. Uh, but um, anyway, uh, yes, so next Wednesday uh, at 8 o'clock, uh, tune into the Facebook uh, uh, stream or the ASV YouTube channel. In fact, there's links there the, uh, on, from the home page. <coughs> from the home page of the ASV, uh, there is a, a couple of links provided in where it says Facebook and where it says ASV YouTube channel, so you can catch up with that. Uh, Okay, I think that's all from that that I can glean. Sky Notes. Time is uh, 17 minutes past the hour. Sky Notes, November 2021. <clears throat> and uh, of course the uh, big thing here for uh, the planetarium is that we've reopened, they are saying here. Uh, congratulations Victoria, you did it, is also what they say. We are delighted to welcome visitors back to Science Works, the Melbourne Planetarium, and all other museums, Victoria rev venues, <laughs> revenues, sorry, uh, venues from Saturday the 30th of October. Uh, okay, so there's a dome under dome under festival, best of Earth, uh, happening. <clears throat> Astro Hour for families, your guide to the lunar eclipse. Astro Hour for families, the light fantastic they're calling it and Astro Hour for Adults, The Light Fantastic. Uh, it's happening for families and for adults. I don't know why there should be any dis dis uh, d uh, difference there, distinction. And Planetarium Nights. So, um, yes, it's all happening. So if you want to find out more information about that, go to uh, Science Works on the Melbourne uh, Planetarium page to find out what is going on. Lunar, partial lunar eclipse. <coughs> How big is this article? Oh, that's a good one, it's only short. Um, the natural phenomenon of a partial lunar eclipse will take place this month on night of the 19th. Melbourne will miss the start of it. The moon will be below uh, the northeastern horizon, but as our neighbour rises, it will only have just reached its maximum, so we can still we can still enjoy the sight follow it later by the impressive full moon. So this partial lunar eclipse is pretty much happening just as, as the moon is rising in our eastern sky. 
on the 19th uh, because we're right on the edge of it. Eclipses can only ever happen at full moon uh, when the moon is on the side of the Earth opposite the Sun and its face, Earthing Hemisphere, is fully illuminated by the sunlight. Occasionally, however, at full moon, its path will briefly bring it into our planet's shadow and we can marvel at an eclipse. Uh, however, no two eclipses are ever quite the same for two principal reasons. Firstly, the Moon's distance from Earth varies by about 50,000 kilometers in an orbit that is not circular but elliptical. And secondly, the Moon takes a path that is tidal uh, at a little, or tilted, sorry, <laughs> that is tilted a little over five degrees in relation to Earth's orbit around the Sun. For most full moons, our lunar neighbour entirely misses the narrow cone of our planet's shadow that reaches out into space well beyond the moon's orbit. On those occasions, no eclipse can take place. But if the moon's distance and the orientation of its orbit are just right, then it will enter Earth's shadow. For some eclipses, it will gaze, graze our shadow and for others it will move deep into it. This complex shadow dance creates the difference uh, or cr creates the different lunar eclipses that we see from Earth. This month's partial lunar eclipse will see the Moon move almost completely but not totally into the Earth's full shadow, the umbra. A clear view to the eastern horizon with no trees or buildings to block the view will be required and a, uh, and a high viewing location would also be good as well. From Melbourne, the eclipse will begin about an hour and a half before the moon rises and reaches its maximum a few minutes before moon rise. As our planet rotates in an easterly direction, the moon will rise clear of the horizon for the partial eclipse to then be fully visible. Over the next hour and a half, as the moon gradually rises, higher it will slowly move out of Earth's shadow and the eclipse will be over. But then we can experience another delight, a full moon for the remainder of the night. So that's scheduled to happen on the 19th of this month, which is when I check the calendar here, it's a Friday. So you'll all be out watching this uh, moonrise <laughs> and not listening to me. Um, <laughs> All right. It actually gives a bit of a timetable here of this partial eclipse. <clears throat> partial eclipse begins at 6:18 p.m. below the horizon. Eclipse maximum occurs at 8:02 p.m. below the horizon. Moon rise here in Melbourne will be 8:09. Melbourne maximum at 8:12 p.m. Moon fully visible, and then the partial eclipse ends at 9.47, so we'll start to see a full moon uh, at after 9.47 p.m. that night, Friday night, for those who are interested in that. Uh, as far as sun times are concerned, uh, the 1st of November we had the sun rising at 6.13 p.m. This is, uh, of course, uh, um, uh, daylight saving times. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, <clears throat> so yeah, first of November, the sun rising was rising at six thirteen, setting at seven fifty four, and then on Thursday the eleventh uh, of uh, November, it'll be rising at six o three, and setting at eight o five, and the day length will be about fourteen o two hours. Then by Sunday the twenty first of November, the moon the sun will be rising at five fifty six, setting at eight sixteen. The day length will be 14 hours and 20 minutes. And then by the end of the month, on the 30th of November, uh, it will be setting, rising at 5.52 and setting at 8.25 with a day length of 14.33 hours. Moon phases. There's a new moon on the 5th of the month, which is today. So we have a new moon in the sky, which you can go out there and make a wish on. Then there's a first quarter on the 11th. There's a full moon with the lunar eclipse on the 19th. And a third quarter on the 27th, Saturday the 27th of uh, the month. Uh, the moon will be at perigee, closest to, this, to the Earth, on Saturday the 6th, 
which is tomorrow, so you can almost throw a stone at it. Uh, it will be at 358,844 kilometres and at apogee, furthest from the Earth, on Sunday the 21st at 406,274 kilometres. Amazing how the moon does that. And as far as a quick rundown of the planets, my goodness, this hour, half hour's already gone. <clears throat> uh, Mercury. Uh, for Mercury, again, it is not visible this month as it's moving behind the sun. Venus continues as a bright evening star in the west of the, in the constellation of Sagittarius. It is visible from 8 p.m. and setting by midnight in early November and then from 8 at 30 p.m. setting about 11.30 p.m. late in the month. As far as Mars goes, Mars is now behind the Sun and is so not visible this month. It is so not visible. <laughs> After its pass around the Sun, the red planet will return to our early morning skies in January. Jupiter. Jupiter remains in the center of the constellation of Capricorn High in the northwest. It is visible from 8 p.m. setting by 2.30 a.m. early in the month and by the end of the month from 8.30 p.m. before setting around 1.30 a.m. So this is really a good time for doing decametric radio emissions to try and detect uh, decametric storms, Jupiter storms um, from Jupiter being a nighttime object at the moment. Saturn is fainter and below Jupiter, uh, also sitting in Capricorn. Early in November it can be seen in the west from 8.30pm until setting around 1.30am and by the end of the month from 9pm before setting at 1am. So Saturn of course is also visible in the sky for folks that have got good telescopes. Meteors. <coughs> uh, this month we have two meteor showers. Uh, although neither is expected to feature more than 10 to 15 meteors an hour if conditions are good. Uh, first up, there are the Taurids, which is an old meteor stream peaking in the first week of November. They can be bright, slow moving and occasionally colourful fireballs. One branch appears near the star cluster Pallades and the other near the red star Aldebaran in Taurus which rises in the northeast around 10 p.m. Around 10 per hour can be seen, but every few years activity increases with brighter meteors and more fireballs. Then later will be the Leonids. Leonids are fairly popular. The Leonids uh, from the 13th through to the 20th of November, peaking on the morning of the 18th, as was the case last month with the Orinids, resulting from Earth passing through the trail of particles left behind by the vast past visits of Comet Halley. So too the Leonids result from the Comet Temple Tuttle that orbits the Sun every 33 years. It reached Perlitherion, <laughs> closest to the Sun, in 1998 uh, after which thousands were seen uh, after after which thousands were seen globally per hour since then the rate has been about 15 meteors per hour they appear in the direction of leo the lion <coughs> which rises in the northeast around 4 a.m. Uh, they are fast and leave lots of trains that can last several minutes so uh, so the torrids they peak on the, where was it, peaking the first week of November at around 10 per hour and uh, and then the the uh, Leonids between the, 9th, the 13th and the 20th peaking on the 18th. Um, oh okay, and there's an interesting image here, uh, Leonids from space. Uh, from NASA, here is an extraordinary, sorry I didn't copy this, I'm only just seeing it right now. Uh, but NASA here has an extraordinary photo of perhaps a dozen Leonids diving into the and vaporizing into the Earth's atmosphere. Stars of the constellation of Aries are at the top and full moon is reflected on the clouds at the lower left. 
the CCD image was taken in 1997 in low Earth orbit by the US Air Force Space Command MSX satellite mid-core space experiment that ran between 1997 to 2013. If I had seen that, I would have copied that image, so you could have checked that on the, on, uh, on the, on the, the YouTube stream. Uh, but it's actually quite an interesting picture taken from Earth uh, seeing all these meteors uh, entering the atmosphere, it's quite um, quite an interesting little image. Yes, all right. Uh, so you can see that if you go to ScienceWorks, uh, uh, just type look, just type in Sky Notes uh, uh, for uh, November in your favourite search engine, and uh, you should see the link to the Planetarium ScienceWorks uh, Sky Notes uh, Sky Notes for November, and you'll see that uh, image there. Um, Alright, now there's a little bit here more on the Leonids. Uh, the Leonid storm, according to Wikipedia, uh, this Wikipedia image shows an 1889 engraving by Adolf Volomey of the famous Leonids meteors of 1833. It was a genuine shower. You can, <laughs> the sky looked like that, everybody would be absolutely frightened as. Uh, it was derived originally from an eyewitness account of seeing hundreds of thousands of meteors falling per hour. Yes, yeah, it's quite an amazing image. Again, I, I, if I had to check this out, I, I would have um, uh, put the link up, the picture up. The International Space Station uh, can be seen on Tuesday the 2nd. What is the date today? It's 5th, yeah. So we've all missed that. Uh, so the next opportunity to see the International Space Station is later in the month on Saturday the 26th at 5.10 a.m. in the morning coming in from the northwest to the southeast and then again on Sunday the following day Sunday the 27th coming across at 4.24 a.m. and uh, from the north northwest to the southeast to the east southeast direction so it's nice and early in the morning uh, all that information for the passing of uh, International Space Station and other satellites of interest can uh, be found from Heavens Above website uh, without a problem. Just type in Heavens Above and uh, you can get the information from Heavens Above but it's a good idea to register because then it's all the information that Heavens Above um, reveals is all based on your location if you uh, register. <sighs> what time is it? 10.31 already. Um, okay. Now the next thing is stars and constellations, but I think I'll uh, let this go f until next Friday. And there's plenty of dates there. <laughs> I'm not sure if I've got time. Well, let's say I'll go up to the. Well, it doesn't have anything for today. I'll go up to um, to the ninth. That'll do because I can see something about Carl Sagan there. <coughs> uh, on the first of November, 1963 then largest radio telescope, the Puerto Rico uh, Arecibo Observatory, opens utilizing a natural valley and transceiver suspended from pylons in nearby peaks. So there you go. I, if I had to remember that, I would have done a special celebration on the 1st of November. So 1st of November 1963, Arecibo begins operation. Uh, on the 3rd of November 1957, Laika, L-A-I-K-A, Laika, -A, a three year husky Samoid dog, became the first animal into orbit in Sputnik 2. Uh, while never intended to return to Earth, she expired from heat stresses after only a few hours. Unbelievable. Also on the 3rd of uh, November 1973, Mariner 10 launches to Mercury and uh, the first probe to use a gravitational slingshot around a planet to reach an objective, in this case Venus. On the 4th of November 2003, the largest solar flare was recorded, causes blackouts, radio blackouts and saturates saturates satellites and was associated with the coronal mass ejection many times larger than Earth leaving um, leaving the Sun at 2,300 kilometers an hour. On the 8th of November 1656, the birth of the second astronomer Royal Edmund Halley 
who calculated several historical comments to, 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 the, to be the same. He successfully predicted its regular 76 year return and of course it carries his name. On the 9th of November 1934, the birth of American astrophysicist and science communicator Carl Sagan. So that's yet to come, but on the 9th of November, which is Tuesday, uh, <laughs> let's all have a drink for in memory of Carl Sagan. Might even put on Cosmos, uh, <laughs> not Cosmos, um, Contact. Oh, that's the last of my coffee. Um, okay, plenty of other dates. I'll leave them till next week. Okay, now I would uh, segue into our <clears throat> our podcast which is Dr. Alina Adonna, and she's talking about sunquakes. Um, so let's see if we can just get this all up and running. Don't want that. Go away. Uh, go into my video mix. And if all is okay on the dark side of the moon, hang on a sec, um, get that there. Uh, but I wanted to get that up there. Yeah. Um, and I'll, I'll bring up this little slide for the video people. Bring up my audio and I'll just uh, bring in the uh, audio and uh, let's see how we go with this. So stand by. Today's interviews come from the Australian Space Research Conference that was recently held in Melbourne and I'd like to thank Wayne Short, the co-chair of the conference, for giving me access to the conference. Thanks very much, Wayne. We've got two interviews today. The first is from Dr. Alina Donner and she does amazing things with maths and using phase shifting she very accurately predicts active regions in the sun that appear around the eastern limb right on cue please be aware that because this interview was taken in a public place at a conference there are some extraneous noises and sounds coming through so let's cut straight to that interview now can you tell us, Doctor, when you first developed an interest in science? Well, I was a kid yep. and I just loved mathematics. And then I remember my father was always cutting potatoes for me to look in, you know, at images in 3D. And then he used to explain me about this and this and this and about a bit about the sun. And then that's it. When I went to university, I just liked. I went to the physics department, the physics department in Bucharest. And uh, yeah, I was interested in astronomy all the time. <laughs> And then I had an opportunity to do a PhD in black holes, and that was in Germany. And I learned about plasma physics, which when I returned back to Romania, I applied it to solar physics. And since then, I, I'm just doing solar physics because it's, you know, the sun is close to us. It's very good to have it just very close to us. <laughs> Fantastic. So I've just attended your talk, and you were explaining all about solar acoustic halos and waves that travel through the sun, and you use those acoustic waves to predict what's happening on the other side of the sun. Could you explain that in very general terms? All right. So we have sound waves trapped in the sun, and they travel everywhere inside the sun. When these waves travel through the interior of the sun and bounce back Back at the back of the sun, they may encounter some magnetic field regions. When acoustic waves interact with a magnetic field, energy, the power that they carry, is a bit absorbed. So they lose, uh, acoustic waves really interact strongly with a magnetic field, and then the acoustic waves try to travel back from where they arrived, they started, but then there is what we call a delay, phase shift, or the travel time between starting point to end point is now different than the travel time between end point back into the original. So this is what the magnetic field does to acoustic waves in the sun. And we use this information. So it's fantastic. So it becomes a prediction model. What technology do you use to detect what's happening in the sun? So we use satellite observations. We have what we call Doppler images of the sun. The images measure the velocity at the solar surface. The satellites, solar 
dynamic observatory and one ground-based instrument which is named GONG, mainly global oscillation. And one of the instruments is actually here in Australia and they have six instruments that they keep observing the sun all the time. So these are the satellites giving us measurements. We take those measurements and we apply some mathematical models to these, assuming that we know what's inside the sun, yep. what's the structure of the sun. We predict what's at the back of the sun. And we, those predictions come true with a we, pretty, yeah, good, have, yeah. pretty good accuracy. We still have to work to improve it, to get a spatial correct. So how long does it take an echo to travel from one side of the sun to the other? Hours. Hours. Now, can you use your model and your data to predict when there's going to be big CMEs coming out of the sun? Uh, I would be very rich if I can do that. <laughs> what we can see at the back of the sun with this technique that's called helioseismic holography is a big active region, big active a big region. sign of a big active region. And that active region can tell us a story, can tell us, okay, I'm big enough that I can flare, I, I'm big enough that I can generate a CME, but we don't know for sure if that's going to happen. The statistics stops at one stage. Yep. We know whatever is big can, should generate something important, something big. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Dene. It's been fantastic yeah. speaking with you. Yeah, thank you very much. That was Dr. Elena Donner. Elena works at the School of Mathematical Sciences at Monash University as a senior lecturer. She's a member of the Monash Centre for Astrophysics and teaches large classes of engineering students, advanced engineering mathematics and science students. She's an expert in helioseismic holography, a mathematical method which can tell you how loud is the sun. She can detect solar quakes in satellite images from state-of-the-art instruments. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm just going to stop that in a sec. Right. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, uh, Brendan O'Brien, uh, for the uh, courtesy to uh, allow me to play the audio podcast. There, there's plenty more to come. I do apologise for, and I think uh, I think Brendan did um, uh, indicate there just before the the uh, the recording that um, uh, there was background noise. Uh, he managed to to grab. Uh, uh, Alina from um, uh, from the uh, the uh, lecture theatre or wherever it was. <laughs> so there was a, a a lecture going on in the background. So there was um, unfortunately I couldn't do too much about the background noise. Uh, but um, and I think um, I think Brendan was trying his best in the post uh, uh, recording to, uh, to to try and minimise the background noise. So there's a lot of digital artefacts uh, in that recording. Anyway, um, that's fine. Uh, we got that finally done. Uh, we were going to play that last week, but uh, I don't know, for some reason it didn't work for me. Okay, you're tuned to VK3 EKH, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the uh, official station of the ASV, Astronomical Society of Victoria. And, um, and uh, acknowledge Rob there about uh, the email address. That's fine. Um, I'm not sure who's involved with the uh, website these days. I think Linda still is, but uh, some other bloke I think is also there too. Um, now, uh, I've got some wonderful pictures here to show of the aurora um, that occurred over the um, last few days. And let me see how we can get this up. Uh, there was something coming up on behind me there on the radio. I'm not sure who that was. Um, all right, now let me see if we can do this. Uh, I've got a first picture here. It is taken at Black Rock. Let's see if we can just bring this up and I'll have to. Yep, my audio disappears. All right, so there's a picture that was taken of the recent uh, Aurora Australis, uh, and that was taken at uh, Black Rock by. Um, I've uh, got his name here by Roger uh, Balker. Yep, it's even got it on the photograph there too. Uh, Roger Balker taken at Black Rock. Uh, some really interesting pictures there. So if you're watching on um, YouTube, you can get a chance to see this. 
Uh, next image is uh, this one here, and good, the audio is still there. And this is at Ricketts Point, and this is taken by Russell Cockman, which is Russell is the section director for the solar solar section of the ASV, and uh, uh, Russell was down at Ricketts Point, and you can just just make out the subtlety of the aurora in that image there on the horizon, just a faint purpley glow. Uh, the next image here, which is uh, more striking. Um, and this one here is by Steve De Lessy. Steve De Lessy, De 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 Less, Less, Lissy, Lissy. Steve De Lessy. I think that's how you pronounce that. And that's taken at Flinders, um, down at Flinders. And uh, I don't know if some information here. No, that's some. That's for another one. Okay, so that's from down at the looking for Lind down at Flinders, looking south. Rather striking Im image. Uh, hang on, uh, just a sec. Got the wrong one. There we go. Now you can see it. This is this is the one at Flinders. Sorry about that. Didn't switch the slide over. So this is uh, at Flinders, uh, looking south by Steve Delisi, and uh, really interesting, uh, stri uh, striking light there coming up. It's like some somebody shining a bright light up into the atmosphere. It's, I've never seen that uh, before. So that's really quite uh, uh, quite a striking image as well. Then there's this one, <coughs> and this is down at a place called Wandoon, Wandoon, uh, which is uh, near Wandoon North, which is near uh, Warnbull in Western Victoria, and that's taken by Justin McQualter, Justine, sorry, Justine, Justine McQualter at Wardoon, in Wardoon North in uh, uh, Warnbull, and. Uh, I missed all this, so I've been dying to see the aurora. Uh, I've yet to see it, and there it is. I completely missed it again. Here's another image. Um, this one here is uh, taken by Rosie Appleton. Uh, Rosie Appleton down at uh, Balnearing Beach. She was down at Balnearing Beach, and uh, some beautiful images there, just right on the horizon, and managed to capture. I don't know whether it's. Um, uh, a, a meteor and shot there, or whether it's a, a, an aircraft. It's probably a, an aircraft that was flying uh, at the time. Uh, she's just got a, the child tail lights uh, uh, in view at the same time. So that's uh, that shot. And there's another one here. Uh, and this is by Linda Richmond. Linda's uh, one of the members of the ASV as well. G'day, Linda, if you're listening. This was taken at Point Leo. Uh, now I can tell you that uh, to capture that image, it took a 54 second exposure to uh, to capture that image there. Uh, it was a 54 second um, exposure at Point Leo by Linda. Not a bad one there, uh, Linda. Um, she was asked the question on the Facebook page, uh, was there any colour? And uh, she pointed out that uh, by eye, uh, the, um, uh, the, the uh, uh, aurora takes on a, more of a grey a grey sort of a look, um, but it's the camera, because of the long exposure, uh, it's the camera that actually uh, picked up uh, or, or managed, manages to extract the uh, the colours uh, in, in the aurora, so that's an interesting comment. Uh, next image, <coughs> and this is by Tim Burton, uh, Bruton, sorry, Tim Bruton, and he was down at the Kui, 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 Kui Rup uh, location, Kuirup, Kuirup, and uh, he took this image uh, through a lookout stand, um, an observation stand. So it's an interesting sort of an image at, uh, of uh, of the aurora, uh, looking through this uh, uh, lookout stand thing that's down there, Kuirup. Okay, is there any more images here? Yeah, I think that's about all I've got here of the recent aurora. Uh, so uh, yeah, pretty pretty stunning stuff, and I, I hope one day. To be able to get uh, some of these images it would be a um, fantastic thing to be able to do. This is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria with the regular Friday night broadcast. Uh, where was I going to next? It's, um, uh, okay, it's 10.48, so... Um, uh, 
just going to see what else I had ready to go from this point in time. Um, yeah, okay. It's a very short article. Okay. This is uh, potentially interesting. Now I've got a slide for this. So I'll just uh, bring up that slide. Um, I think I had a slide for it. I can't see it now. Uh, no, I thought I did. All right, that's no good. All right, anyway, I'll go and read it out. That's, that's good enough for me. I thought I did. Well, maybe I, well, I did, but I didn't bring it across. That was a problem. Uh, astronomers confirm the large Magellanic cloud is a galactic cannibal. Uh, galaxies grow by merging with other, uh, with and absorbing others. Now researchers have spotted evidence of one such merger in the Milky Way's largest satellite, November 2, 2021. Galaxies grow by attracting and absorbing smaller galaxies, beefing up their masses along the way. We have ample evidence our Milky Way has done exactly that as well as a roadmap to how our galaxy will continue to bulk up in the future. We, are already, we already know that the Milky Way is surrounded by a plethora of smaller satellite galaxies that it will eventually devour. The largest of these is the Large Magellanic Cloud, ML, in LMC. <clears throat> but now, Researchers have shown that the galactic food chain extends even further. They found they have found evidence that the LMC has likewise gobbled up its own share of small galaxies in its past, allowing it to grow into the sizable satellite we see today. The evidence comes from one of the LMC's global clusters, Globular, globular clusters. These are ancient compact groups of stars that, because they are so long-lived, can provide clues about our galaxy's history. In this case, researchers studied 11 globular clusters in the LMC, comparing the mix of elements within the stars. One stood out. The cluster NGC 2005, which has fewer elements such as copper, calcium, silicon and zinc, uh, uh, then its brethren, then its brethren. That elemental difference led researchers to surmise that NGC 2005 doesn't have the same origin story, origin story, origin story as the other clusters. <clears throat> Instead, it's likely all that's left of a small galaxy the LMC gobbled up billions of years ago. Most of the unlucky galaxy was fully absorbed into the LMC, making it indistinguishable from the LMC's own stars. But the central region of the galactic snack survived in the form of a globular cluster. The find, the team says, convincingly shows that even small galaxies can prey on each other to grow, more fully completing, their, uh, competing, completing our picture uh, of the hierarchical galaxy evolution. The work was published October 18 in Nature Astronomy. So there was a picture there, but it doesn't show you too much anyway. But nevertheless, astronomers confirm that the large Magellanic cloud is a galactic cannibal. It happens everywhere, I tell you. You're tuned to the ASV broadcast, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, um, broadcasting here on all these wonderful frequencies. <laughs> now. This should bring me up to the hour. Um, it's about Jupiter. And I don't want to show it because there's a nice little GIF image here of the red spot. NASA's Juno mission, let me actually uh, bring that up while I'm um, thinking of it. So back to vMix and uh, where are we here? Bring that up and bring in my audio again. So for those watching YouTube and the uh, direct feed, <laughs> should be seeing a movie of the red spot rather interesting image. Back to the article. <clears throat> uh, NASA's Juno mission has obtained measurements that finally say just how deep the red spot actually goes. Just how far down does Jupiter's iconic red spot actually go? The deep roots of the centuries-long storm has could be a clue to its longevity. According to new results announced by a team behind NASA's Juno mission, Previous work using the microwave radiometer of NASA's Juno spacecraft still zipping around the planet, 
every 53 days probe the depths of the great red spot. But while microwaves can help scientists peel back the top cloud layers, the microwave observations could only show that the great red spot is still going strong 200 kilometers below the cloud tops. Now, a study in October 28, Science, now puts a bottom limit to its depth. Juno scientists Marisa Parasi at the NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory led an effort utilizing two Juno passes that had the spacecraft zipping right over the Great Red Spot. The team also analyzed data from another 10 passes. Flying at about 130,000 miles per hour, or 59 kilometers a second, uh, when at its closest, the spacecraft's path changed ever so slightly because of the uneven distribution of mass in the clouds below. By measuring deviations to Juno's expected path to within 0.01 mm per second, researchers were able to peer deep within the planet. Parasi and colleagues reported that the Great Red Spot extends at most, f at most 500 kilometers down. The bulk of the storm's mass is probably within the top 300 kilometers or so. Most of the scientific community was thinking the Great Red Spot um, was shallow, Parasi says. We were surprised that it actually goes so deep. Despite shrinking over the past few decades, the Great Red Spot still is still wider than the Earth's diameter. So the storm itself is somewhat pancake-shaped, just a thicker pancake than scientists had expected. For context, Jupiter's stripes, the brown red belts and whitish zones extend much deeper down in to about 3,000 kilometers or about 4% of the way to the core. Nevertheless, the unexpected depth means that the pumpkin colored vortex is rooted beneath the water condensation layer, indeed beneath the entire cloud layer and well beneath the reach of sunlight. The kind, the finding uh, gives scientists food for thought as they puzzle over the, me the mechanisms that might drive this storm. While, most, while, while the most obvious of Jupiter's storms, the Great Red Spot is far from the only one. Amateur astronomers can see on the older can see on the order of 100 storm-like features on the King of Planets and Juno's close-up view reveals on the order of 1,000 cyclones and anticyclones pop up clouds and brown barge dotting the planet's surface. In a separate article in the October 28th of Science magazine, Juno's principal investigator Scott Bolton of the Southwest Research Institute and colleagues showed that other swirls on Jupiter can also run deep though not as deep as the Great Red Spot. They extend to an average depth of about 100 uh, kilometers down. However, Bolton noted as NASA's press conference uh, that the Great Red Spot is not necessarily the deepest of all the storms. The long-lasting cyclones at Jupiter's poles could also be in competition for the title. Jupiter's cyclones affect each other's motion, causing them to oscillate about an equilibrium position, says Juno co-investigator Asselindro Mora, National Institute of Astrophysics in Rome. The behavior of these slow oscillations suggests that they have deep roots. Mora led a study of the polar cyclones that appeared, to be, to be, that appeared in the July 28th issue of Geophysical Research Letters. The measurements indicate that all the storms, not just the Great Red Spot, are rooted in regions out of reach of sunlight and the water, contents and the water condensation cycle, two processes known to drive storms on Earth. There might be small-scale processes at work, such as vertical winds or rain or hail of something or something uh, other than pure water. The storm's depths might also indicate that the top weather layer is connected in some way to the planet's interior. Fortunately, the Juno mission should have plenty more time to explore the mysteries within Jupiter after more than five years orbiting the giant planet and within 37 close passes under its belt to date, it's ready for more. NASA recently approved an extended mission that will take Juno to September 2025 if all holds up 
and so far the spacecraft is doing well despite the dangerous energetic particle environment within Jupiter's magnetosphere in, the part, in part due to the longer and wider orbits uh, than were originally planned. Bolton adds with a grin, the shields are holding. You're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria. With the regular Friday night broadcast time is 1 minute to 11. I could continue on. There are a number of other articles here of interest. Uh, they'll just have to hold out to next week. So I shall go across to space weather. So current space weather is the solar wind is currently at 581.7 kilometers a second at a density of 8.8 .8 protons per cubic centimeter. There are two sunspots on the disk of the sun facing Earth at the moment, designated AR2893 and AR2891. To date, so, so far the sunspot number is 28, whilst the radio sun is hovering at 94 solar flux units, measured at a wavelength of 10.7 centimetres. The storm is over. Earth's magnetic field is calming as our, planet's, as our planet exits the wake of a cannibal CME which struck on the 3rd of November. Almost 20 hours of strong geomagnetic storms followed the CME's impact. During the apex of the Category G3 event, auroras were sighted as far as south as California, New Mexico and Colorado. Um, not to mention what we've seen here in Australia. So, uh, yes, that's all old news now. <laughs> um, and of course, the the US has a, a something called the NASA All Sky Camera, where they track fireballs. They've had 15 fireballs in the last uh, since um, over the last week, let's say. And uh, as far as near, near dangerous potential hazardous asteroids. As of the 5th of November, uh, there is 2,226 potentially hazardous asteroids. In fact, there was an article in the news tonight, the 6 o'clock news, um, where the NASA is about to uh, smash a, um, uh, a probe, I forget the name of the probe, uh, but they're about to smash a probe into an asteroid to see if they can change the orbit ever so slightly. Uh, but it's a t an experiment just to see if they can do it by Im impacting an object into it. So we'll have more on that information or that uh, story next week. On that, I think we shall conclude our session for tonight. Um, back to vMix. Oh, there I am. Uh, so, <laughs> so thanks everybody for listening to tonight's session. It's uh, been a bit, uh, bit uh, well, it's worked out reasonably well. Uh, we have um, an email that came in from Andrew. It's the only email that I've got tonight, from what I can see. But Andrew VK3VIN has checked in, and he's reporting that uh, he's listening on 80 meters with armchair copy. Uh, but there, there's no. Um, oh, that's that's uh, Andrew VK3KIS, I should say. He's uh, saying at 80 meters is armchair copy, which is good. Uh, there was another one here. Um, where did I see it? Um, come on, mouse, behave yourself doing some funny things. No, that's, oh no, here we are, that's, is it today? Uh, I think it is. This is from Ian, VK3VIN, reporting that uh, the signal on 80 meters is good, 20 to 30 over, but 160 is absolutely nothing. Well, I might be able to fix it up next week. And noting that there's a lot of band noise too. Okay, and of course we've had a good bunch of people up there on the uh, chat window. Um, so let's. My mouse is doing something funny. I can't roll down the page properly enough. But uh, anyway, thanks for everybody for tuning in to the uh, Discord uh, chat window. Uh, Joe uh, Martin, VK7 JOH. Uh, we've got Graham GL, Roberto, VK3 XRA, Mike XL, uh, David Ellis, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah. Um, Bill, VK3 KHT. Uh, just checking who else is there, there's lots of conversation going on and I think that's about it, yep, alright, so that's about it for the chat window, so thanks everybody there on the chat window, all very good. 
Um, I think that's it. So, uh, for the stations on the medium wave surface, we are concluding transmissions for tonight. There's no callback on the um, on the 160 meter surface, but uh, there will be a very quick callback on the 80 meter surface. <laughs> so, um, this is VK3 uh, Echo Kilo Hotel. Any stations wishing to send reports on the 160 meter surface uh, can. Um, send an email report to vk3ekh at gmail.com and that will be fine by me. Um, so this is vk3ekh uh, on behalf of the Astronomical Society of Victoria broadcasting since 1988, uh, concluding transmissions on 160 and uh, standby stations on 80 metres. More information about the ASV of course can be found at the website www asv.org.au This is VK3 EKH concluding transmissions on 1865. <coughs> Alrighty then. So, uh, flip the page. Start a new page on my call book. This is VK3 EKH listening on 3541 for any stations wishing to call in. Quite a few weak stations there. Uh, I've got VK3 GL and VK3 NFS <coughs> and VK3 VIN. I think you're there too. Um, very weak tonight, a lot of band noise. So VK3 GL, VK3 November Fox Sierra, and VK3 VIN. Who else was there? Okay, VK3 JR and VK3 KIS, uh, and uh, who else was there? Okay, we've got VK2 ELS, no worries, and who was the other station? Oh, I know there's another station there, I can't quite get you. Try again. Yeah, the band noise is a bit uh, crappy tonight, uh, but there's a couple of other weak stations there, a bit, uh, bit difficult to uh, to copy, but we'll try in a minute. We'll start off at the, the top of the list here, VK3GL, Graham, Bunyip, I have to say, VK3EKH. <laughs> Unfortunately, I've been tied up at work, I'm not able to do so. It will have to wait for another time. 
um, I'm sure we'll catch up with it at some stage. Um, thanks for the other um, new information that you provided tonight. Um, all most interesting. Um, the interview came across quite okay uh, on HF Radio, reported on the uh, YouTube stream that I was watching um, whilst at work tonight. All right. Thank you, Chris. I hope you can have a good weekend as we go each week. And uh, thanks again for the broadcast. Uh, VK3, uh, EKH, VK3GL Bunyip. <coughs> VK3GL uh, in Bunyip, VK3, EKH returning. Okay, note that you're using a different antenna tonight. I don't know whether that's because, uh, as a result of uh, um, causing the weak signal from you. Um, but you're, you're basically 5 and 9. Uh, here at the moment, uh, just just picking uh, on the nine. Um, sometimes maybe up up to ten over nine. So definitely a weaker signal from you tonight. Now again, I don't know whether it's because of the different antenna or whether it's just conditions. Uh, but um, and you, and your audio. I don't know. It's my hearing, but you you. I mean your audio is fine, but it's um, I guess because of all the the lightning crashes, uh, there there could be a, a few more highs in it. Uh, it just sounds a little um, on the, uh, the the bassy side. Uh, but uh, it the, the w- would have been nice if the EQ had have been favouring the, the high end. <laughs> just would have made it easy because I'm playing around with the shift controls, uh, the phase, um, the, uh, the the shift uh, with the controls on the on the receiver here to uh, just to favour the, um, the the sound a little bit better. Nevertheless, anyway, no worries, Graham. Uh, thanks for the coming in, and you better get back to work. Um, <laughs> and okay on the uh, auroras too, no worries at all. Steve, uh, VK3 November Fox Sierra, let's see how we go with you. VK3 NS, VK3 EKH. Steve, VK3 NS, VK3 EKH returning. Yeah, good copy from you. At, at first it was a bit tricky, uh, but your signal started to increase, so uh, you came up to uh, 5 and 9 plus 10. Uh, was that last uh, report there? 5 and 9 plus 10. And uh, I don't, uh, no, no problems about being out in the country. I, If I had the opportunity, I'd be moving out into the country as well, away from this uh, city life and uh, into a nice, quiet, and dark sky location. I. Don't know whether I'll ever get a chance to do that, but um, uh, I, I'm envious of you folks that are out in the countries. <laughs> All right, thanks, Steve. Thanks for calling in. No worries, mate. Um, um, now, the next station I had on the list here was Ian, VK3, Victor, India, November, VK3, VIN, VK3, EKH. Yeah, good day, Quinn. And. Uh United States. And there was a little bit of the United States coming through on 
VIN flat uh, flat uh, flat something kangaroo flat that's it <laughs> VK3 EKH yep no worries um, uh, um, um, Ian um, yeah I think with all the uh, solar activity lately uh, the HF bands uh, are, are bound to have uh, come alive um, but um, <coughs> the uh, Timotha space weather one uh, she's uh, had a, a, a few reports out. Uh, if you're a, a patron of her service, um, she provides a kind of an update at the drop of a hat. Um, she'll just get uh, information that's happening at the time, and then she'll send out a uh, a, a little um, a, um, a little indication on YouTube channel that uh, she's about to go live and. Uh, if you happen to be awake at the time she does that, then you can catch in real time the latest, the very latest report. So she's she's quite happy to uh, to come up on YouTube channel, and she gets uh, quite a few hundred people uh, checking in on her YouTube channel. But of course, you you've got to be um, a so-called patron to uh, to see that, and uh, I'm never around to see the live um, when she goes live. Uh, I only catch up with the uh, the recording of the YouTube on the YouTube channel, but she's uh, she's absolutely uh, ecstatic at the moment. Pardon the pun um, on um, the recent CME. Uh, she just thinks it's an, an absolute thrill, uh, and of course because she's a radio amateur herself, a lot of re uh, references are to the amateur fraternity as far as uh, what the conditions on shortwave must be like or will be like. So I generally wait until she does a 10 minute report um, and of course her 10 minute reports always come out over the weekend uh, so by the time I play it which is next Friday uh, it'll be already four or five days late in, in, the, in the prediction side of it not much I can do about that but anyway it's just the, uh, the fun of it I suppose anyway it has been an exciting uh, couple of days and of course uh, cycle 25 we're still ramping up uh, so there's going to be a whole lot more solar flare activity, a whole lot more uh, coronal mass ejections and uh, with so many eyes on the sun, um, so many uh, scientific instruments now looking at the sun, of course uh, um, we're, uh, you know, we're able to see what's going on so it's uh, pretty interesting. Enough of that. Alright, thanks uh, um, uh, Ian. Uh, next station is Frank, VK3JR, VK3EKH. Okay. Okay. Three K three K three K three K three K. Good evening, Clint, and good evening, everyone. Uh, especially to you, Ian. Uh, you're very good people yourself. Very good indeed. Thank you for the for the nice report. And uh, also, I hope that you grab to you, Andrew. I should say, okay, three K. Uh, 
hate, of course, to you, Jack Ryan Gray. I confirm the report of others that you are muffled tonight, very muffled, most unlike you. So I think something needs uh, attending to there. Uh, except perhaps 4,572 hours from last week. Thank you for doing it. It was very interesting as always. And I uh, look forward to talking again next week. VK. 3 EKH, VK3JR. Yep, thanks, Rake. VK3JR, <clears throat> VK3EKH, good signal from you, peaking 20 over 9. Uh, so definitely coming through uh, without too, too many issues. Um, and there you go, Graham. You've uh, got uh, a couple of other reports from two other stations saying your audio was a bit muffled, so there you go. <laughs> now, across to David, VK2, Echo Lima Sierra. Let's hope your signal wasn't too crash hot, uh, David, but. Uh, We'll see how we go with you. This lightning crashes are pretty pretty strong here. VK2 ELS, VK3 EKH. So David, VK2, Lima, Echo Luma Sierra, VK3, EKH returning. Yeah, a bit tricky to copy all that, um, but uh, I certainly got, um, uh, oh yeah, uh, <laughs> I certainly got um, um, uh, the uh, the parts that you were saying the broadcast was uh, copied uh, reasonably well, and uh, and of course the information that, that uh, came across was uh, made it quite interesting and all that. So yep, thanks for the comments, uh, David. Uh, I caught most of that, but um, uh, um, the other report part of it was a little bit tricky, and uh, something about the the antenna too. So improving the antenna. Um, uh, I'm not sure what you're running right now, but. Um, uh, certainly, uh, a, if if you think that there's an improvement in the antenna side of it, well, that might uh, might just help your signal down here too. I'm not sure if you can do that easily. <coughs> we're uh, we're using an inverted V, just a simple inverted V type antenna here, uh, mounted at uh, the apex point uh, at um, at 13, 14 meters uh, uh, above the ground. So it seems to work quite well for this uh, location. Um, Anyway, thanks David for calling in and uh, hopefully uh, the, the band noise won't be as bad as it is tonight. I'm not sure where the lightning activity is, I haven't checked the, the, the lightning map, uh, but somewhere there is a storm happening. <laughs> Alright, now I think there was another couple of other stations that were pretty weak, um, but we'll give it a go. So, uh, is there anybody else wanting to check in? VK3 EKH listening? Yep, go ahead, Martin. VK7JH, VK3EKH. Okay, thanks. Good signal down here. Uh, yeah, you know, the signal is a little bit noisy, but uh, yeah, we're going to have to get a few of the stations now. Yeah, we're going to hear a little bit of noise in the background. It's not coming through clear as well. So, Paul, well, uh, thank you very much. This last week was uh, a few of the stations. It's uh, all good to know it. Uh, and you're doing well. Good on you, Martin. VK7, JAH, VK3, EKH, returning. Very good. Thank you very much, uh, Martin. You're 5 and 9 plus 10. And, um, yeah, just the uh, lightning crashes are still uh, playing havoc, as, of course. But thanks for the uh, the report and um, and uh, kind words on the uh, material. So all very good. I had stacks of other stuff there. I, I collect a whole lot of stuff, and I sometimes... Uh, if the, the Sky Notes uh, always seem to take up a long time to read through. Uh, so uh, when it comes to the first of the month with the sky notes, I know that I've got uh, half of it, uh, half of the session dealt with easily with the the sky notes report. Anyway, that's another story. <laughs> Thanks, Martin. Anybody else out there? VK3 EKH. Just me, VK3 VAT. 
such a loud signal. Um, <laughs> thanks, Tony. BK3VAT. I better write you down because it makes you legit. Um, use the pen. VAT. Tony. 5 and 9 plus 60. Right. And I know Mike's there too. <laughs> you don't have to come up, Mike, on your dummy load. All right. So if there's nobody else, uh, we'll take one more listen. All right, there's a double uh, that was in and Andrew, and I missed you, Andrew. Did I miss you, Andrew? I did. I completely jumped over. I don't know why that happened. VK3KIS, have a say, mate. <laughs> Sorry about that. VK3KH. <laughs> VK3EKH. Yeah, okay, there was a station tuning up there. The uh, tone was a bit strong in my ear. <laughs> anyway, um, thanks, uh, um, Andrew, for calling in. And uh, I, um, yeah, unfortunately, I, 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 I've yet to see any of the Aurora. If, if there was ever a chance for me to go to the Northern Hemisphere um, to, to actually see the Aurora up there the way they see it, um, I'll, uh, I'd love to do it, uh, but um, <clears throat> yeah, I know the aurora down here um, the, uh, uh, gets to gets to be seen pretty sometimes as far as Queensland, um, depending on how intense it is. South Australia sees it too, uh, so uh, it can be pretty intense. Um, and I, I know that there's plenty of folks that have seen it here in the mainland, so. Uh, uh, I, I, I am, um, <coughs> I am on a, a, an email list which uh, gets sent out. So if there's any reports of aurora uh, activity here, uh, this email is meant to trigger and uh, sends out reports. But so far, my experience of that particular email list is the reports come through well after the event. <laughs> it's not much of a, um, a chance to be able to get out the door straight away if there is something happening. So, uh, yeah, but I mean, uh, magnetometers are also a good way of knowing if there's uh, a rural activity going on and if you can log into a, a one or two magnetometers around the place and see how the field is disrupted quite severely sometimes with these storms, um, uh, you, you'll know straight away, you can sort of hop out the door straight away and see if you can see anything. Mind you, this this location here is a bit tricky. Um, being at the bottom of a hill, my view south isn't very good at all. So for me to see the aurora, I, I would definitely have to drive out somewhere on a on a mountain top somewhere and, uh, and have a look south and see what we can see. 
but there will be plenty of times to do that hopefully so <laughs> anyway look thanks uh, uh, Ian for calling in sorry um, Andrew sorry sorry we uh, we missed you before so um, I don't know how I skipped over you anyway uh, is there any other stations VK3 EKH <laughs> There was another station there, um, standby tech. Um, you're referring to the uh, the dog uh, uh, that went up into the capsule, a uh, Russian capsule. Yes, I don't know what to say about all that. <coughs> um, it look I, on one hand, I can understand how scientists would put animals up there first in anything, any situation, but. You know, just to see what the rea reaction is. That's, I guess. Well, that's you know, just the way science is sometimes needed to be done. Interestingly, uh, there I watched on uh, the Foxtel. It was uh, on Foxtel. There's a uh, a, a doco f film on Tesla. I I was hoping that the the film it would have been more of a dramatized movie on Tesla, Nikola Tesla. But um, it was done in, a, in a, an unusual way. I don't know if anybody's seen it, uh, but it's it was, it's just called Tesla, and it's basically um, looking at uh, Tesla and his theories and his inventions and uh, and in conjunction with where Edison was going. And um, there was a, I don't know how true this is, but uh, uh, they reported in the movie uh, that. Uh, once the uh, electricity uh, had been created and, and invented and generated, they of course there was the uh, aspect of using it to uh, to electrocute human beings that were put in death row. So there was a scene where there was uh, um, the question was asked: Could electricity be used to kill a human being? And um, there was one scene where they actually had a dog uh, with uh, conductors connected to its legs um, uh, on, uh, I think, on all legs, and uh, and of course there was a, a few people about to watch this experiment. Of course, from the the camera point of view, you don't see anything happening to the dog, of course, but it's implied. So. <laughs> I, I sort of cringed at that. I thought, did that really happen? Did they actually uh, electrocute a dog to prove the fact that electricity could be could disable uh, a person and, of course, cause death? So, uh, and of course, then they went, once the the, uh, the the knife switch was uh, thrown to to electrocute this dog. Of course, then the camera looked at people's reactions, and of course, it was all pretty shocking. So there you go. You know, for the in the name of science, there's uh, in the in the past at least. Uh, there are plenty of situations uh, that have uh, happened where um, uh, animals have been used for the experiment. Not so much today. Thank goodness for that. Um, <laughs> anyway, why did we get on to that? Uh, thanks, uh, Ian. Um, Andrew and Ian. Ian. <laughs> now, there was one other station that came in but doubled with uh, Ian, so have another try that other bike. VK3. EKH listening. All right, we got Ch VK3 Charlie Alpha Lima, um, and uh, who was the other station? VK3 Hotel. VK5 Oscar Hotel Radio. Got you that time. All right. Um, okay, uh, VK3 C A L. <laughs> I think I know who that is. VK3 E K H. Yeah, 
Yeah, good day, Calvin. Yeah, good signal from you. Five and nine plus ten coming in quite well over the lightning peaks, scratches and and what, whatever not. <laughs> so <laughs> good to uh, good to hear, mate. Thanks for uh, for calling in. Any any other reports? No. Nope. Okay. All right. Uh, I think it was VK five uh, Oscar Hotel Radio. Good signal, actually. VK five Oscar Hotel Radio. Go ahead. Is that you there, Michael? Um, the K3 Kilo Hotel, I think. I'm going to take five months, I'm going to run over that. Bob, Bravo, Bravo, Adelaide, South Australia. I've actually just, uh, I was just on a friend of mine, the Kiwi SDR, about uh, five minutes ago, having a look through the band. Because uh, they've been marvelling at the, uh, at the uh, Tasmanian uh, Yeah, thanks, Bob. VK5 Oscar Hotel Radio, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, VK3 EKH. The name is Clint, Charlie Lima, India, November Tango. Clint is the name. And uh, the home call signs VK3 CSJ, VK3 Charlie, Sierra, Juliet is the uh, the home call sign. VK3 EKH is, is the official call sign for the Astronomical Society of Victoria, ASV. Uh, every every Friday night we do a broadcast on behalf of the ASV. It's been going since 1988. Um, so uh, every, every Friday night we kick off at uh, 10 o'clock on 3541 and a simulcast on 1865 and uh, YouTube and audio stream and by the Melbourne TV repeater. And uh, yes, <laughs> uh, we go out worldwide that way. <laughs> But um, yeah, thanks Bob for calling in. Not a bad signal from you. And uh, yeah, that's uh, that's uh, that's basically what's happening here at, uh, on a Friday night. You'll, every every Friday, unless I decide not to do it uh, because of whatever reason, I'll I'll usually let people know the uh, the week before if I'm not going to show up the the following Friday. But uh, yep, yeah, there that's uh, the story there. Um, so I'm not sure exactly who uh, the other who the, who you thought I was, but <laughs> there it is. Um, uh, yeah, Clint, VK3CSJ. VK, back to you, quickly, VK5OHR, uh, VK3EKH. Yeah, Uh, 
Yeah, good on you, Rob. We copied all that. VK5 OHR, VK3 EKH returning. Yeah, very good. Um, yeah, well, all right. Well, we've probably got your call sign there in the in the uh, call book somewhere around here <laughs> from long ago. Well, we're still doing it, mate. We're still doing it. And um, okay, on the telescope too. Yeah, I've got a, um, a Celestron, uh, Celestron uh, 800 uh, XTL XLT. Can't remember though, but uh, yeah, a Celestron. Uh, eight, it's, it's called a Celestron 800 because it's an 8-inch mirror, and um, uh, you know, built-in uh, GPS and motor drive. Oh, excuse me. And uh, oh, I've uh, I've only had it for a little while. Um, <clears throat> and uh, in fact, uh, the weekend, um, the weekend of the close conjunction there of um, of Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, it was when I got that telescope, and uh, so the first, uh, what do they call it, uh, the first light, yeah, the first light through the uh, Celestron was a view of uh, Jupiter and Saturn in the one in the same field of view, which was uh, pretty good. Uh, so I, um, uh, but I, I haven't had a chance to take it out uh, since then. Uh, <laughs> I, I want to. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I've got to get um, it, the, the nights are a bit uh, dodgy sometimes here. There's been lots of cloudless, uh, cloud, cloud, cloudy nights, and uh, and the the weather's been a bit chilly. So um, uh, and of course, taking the telescope in and out is uh, always a bit of a hassle. Uh, so I I really do want to um, to build a an observatory here at some stage fairly soon actually. Um, but I'm trying to make up my mind whether to go with a, a roll-off roof concept or a, a spend the money on a dome. Uh, I would prefer a dome because that's basically traditional uh, to have a dome observatory. Um, uh, but uh, they, they are very, very costly, as you probably are aware. Uh, the fiberglass uh, domes don't get made here in Australia. Uh, they're all imported. And uh, the, the particular dome-type observatory that I'm looking at uh, what, do, what do they call it? Um, um, something like Astrodome. I don't know, I can't remember what they call it now. But the dome itself actually sits right on the ground. <coughs> There's no walls, no actual walls that support the dome. This, this, this is a three metre uh, dome that actually rotates at ground level. And you can quite easily have up to three people uh, in the dome uh, at any one time. Uh, but uh, it's a beautiful looking dome. I really like its construction motor controlled of course and that's where the extra expense comes in uh, if, if I can afford to get that dome uh, on uh, uh, at some point then that'll be okay um, I'd have to look at using my super to do it though <laughs> um, but um, yeah I am thinking about a roll-off roof but that's that take the footprint of a roll-off roof is much much greater than a dome so uh, anyway we're thinking of that but I the only way I can really do all this uh, look at the sky is to have an observatory fixed ready to go so I can just walk in walk into the dome and pull the shutters open and start observing or, or what I'm particularly interested in is, is photography and uh, sticking a camera on the telescope and, and taking images which I'm really looking forward to, uh, to doing anyway in the near future at this stage I'm still working um, but I'm very close to deciding to retire and uh, once I retire then um, I have access to my super and then I am definitely going to spend a portion of the super on a few other things so um, it's just not going to be uh, for anything else there anyway <laughs> all right <clears throat> that's enough um, thanks uh, Rob for calling in uh, much appreciated good to hear you and um, we'll be again here all next week to do it again the, I'll just check one more time there's no other stations there VK3 EKH listening VK3 ACZ uh, that's, I think that's Bob go ahead
down to the US. But anyway, um, uh, yeah, the highest band moved as good as they were on the weekend when the conference was on with the last uh, CME that we had. So, uh, well, there you go. Oh, by the way, your uh, 595 attendant uh, said it worked ROT over the road to ruin. And uh, one last thing, Nick, with uh, my first use of the new radio that's following the podcast, I've been adjusting the uh, compression and mic band settings. I'm just wondering what you calibrated the eardrum uh, will make of it. Uh, Anyway, thank you for the uh, broadcast. Uh, it's wonderful as always. Cheers, Clint. VK3, EK, from VK3, ACZ. Yeah, okay, Peter, VK3, ACZ, VK3, EKH. Well, you're basically 5 and 9, um, picking 10, 5 and 9 picking up to 10. Uh, I think the band conditions, the, the local uh, uh, propagation is just a little bit um, off colour tonight. Uh, <laughs> probably a, a result of the aurora to some degree. Um, but. Um, uh, the audio side of it, um, look, the audio sounds all right. Aud you know, the sound quality sounds uh, sounds okay through my um, uh, hi-fi speaker here that I'm using. <laughs> um, so the audio is okay, but I can tell uh, I can tell that um, you're probably a bit uh, a bit on the microphone because uh, I can hear uh, popping breath uh, breath sounds on the on the microphone on every second word. Uh, so you're probably a little bit too close to the, to the microphone. It it actually sounds like you're probably using a uh, like a headset. Uh, it's a sort of uh, sort of sound that you'd expect if you had a, a headset on with the microphone pretty close to you to your mouth. So it's a bit breathy, just a little bit on the breathy side. Um, but I think the overall quality is quite acceptable, given the band noise that's there at the moment. I'm able to copy you reasonably well. Uh, so it's not not too bassy, it's not too tinny. It's it's in the in the in the range there, uh, <coughs> which is uh, working for you. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, probably a little bit uh, too close to the microphone, just a bit on the on the breathy side. Uh, but uh, nothing too super critical, really. It's it actually doesn't sound too bad at all, as far as I can tell. Uh, VK3 ACZ, VK3 EKH. Yes, Yeah, Roger Pete, no worries at all, mate. Thanks very much for calling in, and um, uh, no worries at all. So if that's it, uh, we'll conclude transmissions for tonight. Thanks everybody for joining in and uh, listening to tonight's uh, session, the fifth of November. And uh, we'll be back again next week to uh, kick it all off again with some more interesting articles. So this is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria. Um, ceasing uh, transmissions for tonight on, 18, on um, 3541. And uh, wishing everybody a very safe weekend and following week. Take care and we'll see you next Friday. This is VK3 EKH, uh, often clear on 3541. Uh, yes, go ahead, Dennis. Yes, good evening, Ken. I was waiting until you finished there. Got through uh, talking to everyone. Heard your system tonight. Uh, 160 and 80. Everything worked fine. As one might expect. <laughs> heard a few of the boys. Heard, well, heard Graham and um, Tony and... Uh, Remember, remember them all now. Uh, most most of your old crew seem to be uh, seem to be there. Quite interesting. I got your email the other day too. Well, the other day I saw it today. I didn't know you got the receiver as well. From the you know, I, I knew you had the transmitter, but uh, I didn't know that you were uh, getting the Eddie Stone. Yeah, oh, well, you'll enjoy that if you can carry the damn thing up the stairs. They, uh, they weigh quite a lot. <laughs> they were, well, actually, the 888 uh, the same as the 750, uh, apart from the fact that Jeez, it's... Jeez, uh, watching uh, YouTube. Uh, I, I had a 750, and... Uh, <laughs> but uh, a very good, very good, solid receiver. And... Uh,